I'm Daisha Clay, host of The Classical Classroom, a show where experts teach me about classical music. I used to know very little about classical music, and now I'd like to think that I know slightly more than very little. What I have learned is that classical music isn't the obscure, static art form that I thought that it was. In fact, it's a dynamic force that's doing amazing things in the world right now. Welcome to a Classical Classroom subseries, Music Works. We'll go behind the scenes at concerts, hear amazing artist stories, and look at all the ways that classical music is working in the world today. So welcome to this episode of Classical Classroom Music Works. Uh, as you may or may not know, March is Music in Our Schools Month. And I've got to be honest with you, I hate it. To clarify, I hate that we need a Music in Our Schools Month. It should be obvious, in my opinion, that learning about music is a singularly good thing. Music is fun. Music is teamwork. Music is math. Music is unique self-expression. It calls for emotional maturity. It lights up parts of the brain that, frankly, a lot of us could use some light in. And even though I don't think it needs this justification, it also has been linked to higher standardized test scores and graduation rates. So that the awesome people who advocate for more music in our schools have to advocate for it is a sad commentary on all kinds of governmental, societal, and institutional ills. Which is why I was so excited to get to spend some time at a place right here in Houston that needs no such advocacy. It's a place that I've always wanted to go to since I saw fame on TV, because I am 500 years old and I saw fame on TV. And it's called the High School for the Performing and Visual Arts, or HSPVA for short. It's a place where, as part of the curriculum, students spend about half of every single school day practicing their artistic discipline. For this episode of Music Works, we're going to travel to HSPVA. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. All right, so we're here at the High School for the Performing and Visual Arts. I am in the halls, students everywhere. Pretty excited. I have wanted to see this place my whole life, and I've, I've never gotten to come in. Um, I'm a little disappointed to see that it doesn't look anything like the high school in fame. Uh, there are no people dancing in leg warmers in the halls, but okay, we'll see. Uh, so it looks a little bit institutional, like you know your average public high school, but it's significantly smaller, which is interesting. So we're walking to Denny Hall right now which is the auditorium that lives at the heart of the school. And uh, we're going to go see the orchestra practice for a little bit. And then we're going to talk to the orchestra's conductor and a couple of uh, the students. So that should be fun. All right, let's go on in. Fourth movement, please. We have a lot to do, all right? We're going to have to work quickly today. All right. Here we go. Uh. Let's try one more time. Make sure what you, what you start with has to be gold, all right? Ja-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta. Hello and welcome to the Classical Classroom. Uh, this is a Music Works episode. I'm Daisha Clay and I'm uh, sitting here on a stage in uh, the Denny... <laughs> this is great doing this in front of you guys. Don't make fun of me. Denny Hall? Denny Theater? Um, on stage in the Denny Theater. Okay. In the Denny Theater. Denny Hall. Denny, where am I and why can't I remember it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here on the stage and there are seats and people are staring at me and now I'm babbling. 
Also here with me are two members of the orchestra, uh, Zoe Kagan, uh, who is a flute player, and Nina Pitts, who's a cellist. Uh, Nina, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself first? I'm a junior. I came to HSPBA from a private middle school, and yeah. I was really, really looking forward to being a part of HSPBA. Um, I really love playing the cello. Um, my family is... Um, we're a musical family. My mom plays violin, and my dad plays the bass. And so I got into music at a very young age. Like, how old were you? I think I was four or three. Oh, my gosh. I was playing the <laughs> violin. But um, I really hated standing up when you had to practice the violin. Like, my mom uh -huh. wouldn't let me s sit. So I was like, can I play an instrument where I can sit down? <laughs> and I was like, hey, the cello looks really, really cool. And I was like, yeah, can I play that? And they were like, sure, why not? So... Here we are today. I love that that was the deciding <laughs> yeah. factor for you. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and play. Well, speaking of sitting, also sitting here with me is Zoe. How is that for a segue? Zoe, what's your story? Um, so I'm Zoe. I'm a senior here. I play flute. Um, I'm involved in the orchestra and the band. I'm also orchestra co-president with my two other great co-presidents. Um, and I just love being here yeah you guys sounded great that Thank was you. i've never actually gotten to sit in on an orchestra rehearsal of any sort i mean i was in band when i was in like seventh grade but <laughs> i don't think that counts um so how did you how did you get into playing flute and like how much of a part of your life does that play on a daily basis well, I started in elementary school, and at first I was going to pick French horn because I was like, oh, it's French, that sounds cool. <laughs> and then my elementary band director said I had flute hands, so I just kind of huh. went with flute and I just stuck with it, um, and I've been going with it since then. And um, near my freshman year, I got really excited about it and started doing summer camps and taking lessons and really just having it like a big part of my life. Yeah, cool. So I'm a classical music novice which is why I do this show, because I'm trying to learn yeah. about the music. Mm. Um, as a young person, I had no clue. I mean, my parents listened to rock, and I kind of <laughs> got into jazz just because I thought it was cool. But um, at your age, I mean, I had, like, almost zero knowledge of classical music. How, how do you feel about it? What? Um, uh, well, I used to really love pop music and all this stuff, yeah. and used to listen to that all the time. And then when I got serious about music, I started listening to classical music even more and then I just felt absolutely in love like if you play five seconds of a piece I can name it and it just it's such a wonderful experience because every time I listen I hear something totally different yeah and then there's so many different styles and ways to interpret a piece and so many different ways you can see pictures and images and just mm -hmm. bring a lot into the classical music Who's your favorite composer? Like, what's your favorite? What are you listening to? Definitely depends. Someday I'll love Mahler. The next day I'll love Tchaikovsky. And the next day I'll love Debussy. It just, it just varies on how I'm feeling that day yeah. and what, what I'm playing in school and orchestra and outside of school orchestra. It just really depends. I guess right now um, I've been having Debussy Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn on loop on my iPod. Yeah. So I guess right now it's Debussy. <laughs> That you even know all of those composers as a senior in high school blows my mind. It's <laughs> so cool. Thanks. Nina, how about you? Who's your favorite composer? What are you listening to? I, the way, when I was, throughout I was growing up, I never thought classical music was, I mean, it was the norm. I didn't really think anything of it. Yeah. And then my mom teaches at this, um, it's like a summer program at Santa Barbara, California. It's called the Music Academy of the West. Mm -hmm. It's a great program. Um, and they were putting on an opera. Mm -hmm. And I had never seen one. And my mentor, who was um, who was teaching me a little bit, um, was like, oh, I have a solo in the opera. You should come and hear it. So I went, and I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. But otherwise, and it was like, it made me do classical music more. It made me think deeply about it. And I really love opera. So mm -hmm. I usually, I love Rossini. It's the bel canto opera. It's a light, really, it's usually comedy. It's really yeah. great stuff. And so I really love Rossini, Bellini, and Donizetti. All the ones that rhyme. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also with me today is Brad Smith. He's the conductor of the HSPVA Orchestra. Uh, prior to this, he was the music director of the Symphony Orchestra and Wind Ensemble at the University of Pennsylvania. He studied at UT Austin. 
And uh, while he was music director and conductor of the Delaware County Youth Orchestra, he launched Distinguished Visiting Artist Series with Jennifer Higdon. He's conducted orchestras and worked with soloists all over the U.S. Welcome, Brad. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell me a little bit about at HSPVA. Like, what, what makes it different from other high schools? Yeah, so th- this is a special place. You know, what makes HSPVA unique is the opportunity that the students have to focus in their art discipline for three to four hours a day, three class periods. Every day they get to focus in their art discipline. We have music and we're split into vocal and instrumental department. Mm -hmm. Um, Music is um, the larger department in the school. And then we have uh, dance. We have creative writing, which is a relatively new addition to the curriculum. We have theater. We have visual art. And who am I forgetting? Uh, I think I got everyone. (laughs) Yes. And for the students that I work with, uh, the string musicians and the wind and brass musicians, they would be taking classes like orchestra, wind ensemble, symphonic band, music theory, um, modern music, class piano, Um, You know, a number of courses that we have here where they would focus on all sorts of um, the various aspects of classical music and how that relates to their own instrument. Um, And then, of course, they have time where they're dedicated to practicing their own instrument and developing their skills as a soloist and as a chamber musician. Wow. That's that's intense. I- yeah, so that's that's half of their day e- each day, oh and then the other half they go to you know for most of them incredibly difficult academic courses. You right. Know, most of the kids in orchestra are taking AP or pre AP courses, mm-hmm. um, you know, pre cal and physics and uh, world history and you name it. And and most of them are doing well. Almost all of them are doing very well. I'm really blessed to have you know very talented and smart kids in the orchestra. Do you, do you know like about what size the student body is? Yeah, so we're actually a pretty small school in terms of, you know, uh, large city high schools. Yeah. Uh, we have roughly 730 or 740 students here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, whereas, say, a suburb, you know, a suburban high school in Katy or Fort Ben would be, you know, 2,500 students or 3,000 students. Yeah. So, Everyone auditions to get in here. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a two-step process. The students have to qualify academically to get into the school, but then they also have to do a live audition or in some other art areas, they do something like a portfolio presentation where they're, they're judged essentially. And then, um, the, you know, the instructors across the school and across the art disciplines determine the cream of the crop, and those are the students that we invite to become uh, part of the student body at HSPVA. You know what, though? That's To me, that's one of the wonderful aspects about this place is that you really do get to know everyone, yeah. and you're seeing the same people in the hallway, and you're interacting with theater kids, you're interacting with visual arts students, and there's there's a lot of collaboration and there's a whole lot of mutual support mm-hmm. of each other's disciplines. Um, and that's, that's something that you see here that you don't get in your regular neighborhood high school yeah. experience. And you've worked with, you know, adult orchestras. Now you're working with, it, it's, you've spent a lot of your career working with young people too. What's it like to watch young people absorbing all of this information i mean it's really energizing and um it's touching to me to see the amount of hard work that the students put in to their craft here Mm -hmm. and and the the corresponding result that can come from that at their age Um, you know, putting in a significant amount of practice time and having the opportunity to study together in such a concentrated and focused environment, they can just make progress in leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if if take them out of this environment and put them 10 years later, you know, at post-college, the the progress is, it's not nearly as fast. And it's, it's just like, 
uh, it's amazing to to see the progress that any one student can make from you know the beginning of September even up till uh, Christmas break. Yeah, and um, that's I mean for me that's just it's it's a real joy. I I've always loved teaching and even though I I had the great pleasure of working with university students, um, really smart university students, of course, at Penn, and uh, and some adults there as well in uh, professional orchestra. For me, honestly, maybe hopefully this won't get back to Pennsylvania, but <laughs> really the highlight of my time in Pennsylvania was my time with my youth orchestra there. Mm-hmm. The high school students came with so much energy compared to my university students who always seem to be dragging in, you know, and I, <laughs> I, I just had to just feed them energy, you know, in, in heaping mounds to right. try to get them to do anything. Um, but the high school kids come in and they're ready to go. They're just instantly ready to go. That's amazing. I mean, that's that's kind of the opposite of what you hear about high school kids from uh, TV and you know yeah uh, which is you're right and that's culture. unfortunate yeah. um, because young people are often so characterized as being you know listless and uninspired and yeah you know boy I would I would just invite them to come spend a day here yeah I, I always think that I have been on a creative decline since I was about 17 that's when I hit my <laughs> peak <laughs> I'm a huge fan of sarcasm and irony. Oh, I am too. My students will (laughs) tell you that I'm extremely sarcastic. (laughs) But there's something about, like, I don't know, the the sort of genuine and earnest way that music conveys emotion, or can convey Mm. emotion. Not that it can't also be sarcastic and ironic, but there's something required of you, I think, to, to be able to be a real musician uh, you have to, to be, be honest to yeah with yourself and you have to be honest with the people you're performing for and in the case of my students we have to all be really honest and vulnerable with each other yeah in the That's rehearsal the I was looking for. and you know to the to the degree that any one player is willing or not willing to open up and be vulnerable and and sort of allow themselves to be moved mm-hmm. will determine, you know, the success of the performance. Nina, you come to orchestra practice every day. You, you spend all this time practicing. How, how is it rehearsing with, with an orchestra as opposed to, say, playing on your own and spending lots of time practicing in a room? You have to be more aware of the people around you. Like, you have to be able to listen to the back of the first violin section and all the way mm-hmm. to the front and all the way to the winds, too. Yeah. Um, because orchestra is a, it's like a, it's a group. It's a group activity. Mm-hmm. So you have to be involved constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Paying attention to people around you and, like, do you, I always wonder about that when I'm watching orchestras. Do you just sense each other? Are you actually, like, looking around? Are you talking? Um... Eye contact is one of the best ways yeah. um, for us to communicate in the orchestra. Another way is breathing. Like when you breathe together, it helps you play more together and you can sense everyone. That's cool. Breathing with other people. That's, <laughs> that's kind of neat. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me about your, you, you sometimes rehearse with a full orchestra, sometimes with portions. That's of right. Orchestra. So um, our class schedule here, at HSPVA is is what we call a block schedule, where each class period is 90 minutes long, yeah. um, which is ideal for um, focusing in art areas, mm-hmm. having that extended time. Um, and so what would happen in a regular week is we would have one day where the students would come and participate in full orchestra, meaning uh, not just the strings, but winds, brass, percussion as well. And then the following day, 
the wind players would be in their wind ensemble rehearsal as mm -hmm. their large ensemble, and uh, my string players would be strings only in the opposite time from the previous day where we had full orchestra. So you get like some concentrated. Yeah, so we like, have strings every day, and then we add the wind, brass, and percussion players every other day, essentially. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting because I kind of wondered about that as I was watching. I was like, how does one man? get all of these. <laughs> I mean, the students put in a, a, a lot clearly of prayer a lot of work, a lot of prayer. <laughs> crossing your fingers. Yes, all of these things are very helpful. <laughs> well, I'm excited for you guys. I mean, that that um, rehearsal was was great. The Scaramouche was so cool. It's a fun little piece. And Tyler's yeah. extremely talented. He's a, a, such a versatile musician. He's yeah. um, a very talented jazz musician. Mm -hmm. And um, his playing, as, um, you know, as you heard immediately, just has a real ease about it. Yeah. Um, he's such a comfortable player. He's very smooth. Very smooth. <laughs> very smooth. He's smooth in the hallway, too, <laughs> in conversations. So Tyler's a smooth guy. I can see guy. that. I yeah. can see that. It is music in the schools month and, um, you know, unfortunately there's a need for a music in the schools month because this, I mean, this funding is just slashed and burned before anything else. And like uh, uh, schools are turning to nonprofit organizations to help them fund their programs. Like, what are your thoughts on that? You know, you really hit it on the head when you said, um, it's unfortunate that we even have to have music in the schools month. Yeah. Um, for as long as I've been teaching, which is, I guess, about 20 years now in music education circles, it seems like there's always been this undercurrent of advocacy. We, ha we have to advocate for our programs. Right. Yeah. We're constantly working with each other to try to come up with better ways to communicate with the people who hold the purse strings, you know, with mm -hmm. the school boards, with administration, um, with communities, frankly. And it's, it is really sad to know that there are places and they're, and they're right around us. There are places where kids in elementary school will never be exposed to classical music, yeah. that they will never have a lesson about the violin or about the trumpet, or they will never hear um, the music of Bach or Beethoven mm -hmm. or Mozart. They'll never know what a contemporary composer is. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about that? Zoe? It's been, classical music has been with us for such a long time, and just music in general, the arts, funding for the arts. Um, and to cut that is to kind of cut a basis of American culture, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I've been thinking about that. Um, the f cutting the funding has also really influenced uh, my future thoughts about what I, what I want to do about music. Like, I want huh. to encourage more young people to get themselves involved, to get their parents involved, and their parents tell their friends. And then there's more, um, there's more awareness about the joys of having that classical music, the joys of seeing an instrument and knowing what it's like to hear that kind of history. Yeah. Um, so it does <laughs> kind of break my heart a little bit that, or a lot of it, that there is a cut in funding. To me, it's stunning. Um, it's, it's hard to fathom. It, it's really, um, uh, I was really blessed to, to be in a, to grow up in a small town, but yet still have wonderful music teachers from elementary school through middle school and into high school yeah. um, who inspired me to to keep at it and to to stick with it and to to just discover and realize how wonderful music is and mm -hmm. what a blessing it is to be able to be involved in it yeah for me that's my perspective I've always considered it um, my privilege you know an honor to be able to be involved in in the creation of of music with an orchestra you know what i don't hear you saying is boy it's going to help those standardized test scores yeah. and you know i think that's what's so interesting how you know when you see these articles about 
the benefits of music education. They're always trying to quantify it somehow. Yes, it's you're exactly right. It's always about all the buzzwords in um, articles about how important music edu- education is. Typically, will be things like teamwork, um, uh, the ability to have higher order spatial reasoning, um, right. the, the connection between um, many musicians and uh, math and science, the, the strong connections there. And there, and there are connections that have been you know, studied. But for me, I, I read articles that just like the ones you're describing, and I get to the end and I often ask, well, where was the beauty? Where was the yeah. The conversation about the wonderful emotion and feeling involved in the study of music yeah. and how music makes us better people. Creating music in an ensemble like this with these students, you know, that we just had rehearsal with, you know, 70, I like to call it 70 of my closest friends <laughs> and, and collaborating with people to to perform this amazing, you know, these masterworks that were written by Brahms and Prokofiev. And, um, you know, to make that happen is a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's an emotional thing. It's an, and it's touching. And these students will leave here and go out in the world and they'll be better people yeah. because they have studied classical music, regardless of whether they eventually end up, you know, being a professional musician or a music teacher or a businessman. Mm -hmm. Zoe, what are your thoughts on that? There's also so much depth in classical music and learning from like our teachers, like, oh, this is about this. And it's like, oh, I didn't really think about that. And it also, having classical music helps me think on a deeper level about a lot of different things. So I feel like being in rehearsal and just learning something new every day definitely helps me with other areas of study. Nina, how about you? I think, like, when I see programs, like, I saw a news program on, um, they were doing music in Africa, they were introducing music, and I thought, I was like, that's really great. And so, like, when people can experience music, I think it's, like, the greatest thing. Because it brings, like, I think it brings emotion, and it brings passion, and you can see the world on a different level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like this world or wordless way of expressing or I guess in the case of opera there are words involved but but you know like there's something about the way that music conveys emotion that like no other thing can do absolutely performing playing an instrument or singing and performing music at a high level requires a huge amount of trust Mm -hmm. trusting yourself trusting each other in an ensemble setting like this. And it requires a lot of soul searching, you know, Mm -hmm. to spend, to spend hours in a practice room by yourself working again and again and again to refine something Mm -hmm. and to try to put that in, you know, and then back it up and put it into a larger picture of a piece, you know, a beautiful concerto that a composer has written to try to, do that to be successful at it requires as you say being in touch with yourself Mm -hmm. in order to pull that off and for an audience you know audiences are (laughs) there's a lot of talk about how um you know how we need to educate our classical music audiences i always hate that because audiences (laughs) are a lot smarter than we think they are and they can tell they can tell phony music making in an instant Mm -hmm. i think and you know when you walk out on stage and you perform as a classical musician i think people know instantly if you are performing from your heart if you're performing with emotion with soul with feeling Mm -hmm. and and with thought with careful thought that Mm -hmm. you've given to the piece those those things come across to people Mm -hmm. Um, those are those are human connections there's you know they're not just musical connections it's not just about you know black ink on a page arranged in certain patterns that's about connecting with people right and that's where you know to me that's what the 
articles about music education should be talking about. Yeah. How how are we connecting as people with one another, and and you can how how can we use this vehicle of yeah. classical music to do that? Yeah, that was very well put, and you know hopefully that will be the next evolution of this conversation that's been going on for quite some time about music in our schools. Well, everybody, Brad Smith, Zoe Kagan, Nina Pitts, thank you so much for talking with us on The Classical Classroom. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, everybody, that does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom. You can also find us on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash classroom. We're on the Twitters, the Tumblers, etc. You can listen to us on your mobile device, on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, what have you. Send me an email at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Thanks today to audio producer Todd Tryhard Holslander for making us sound nice. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for an entire week of pullover sweaters. Thanks to editor Mark DeClaudio for his piercing velvet Elvis eyes. Thanks to Brad Smith, Zoe Kagan, and Nina Pitts for taking the time to be on the show. Thanks to the HSPVA orchestra people who have been staring at me this entire time and making me super nervous. You guys are awesome. Thanks to composer George Heathco for uh, the theme music to Music Works. Thanks to me for saying words, but most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time.